Are you looking for truth from God's Word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. If we don't do what God tells us to do to receive the antidote to that death, we will spend eternity separated from Him in death. So the first death is being spiritually dead, separated from God from God. You could be alive, you could laugh, you could jump, you could surf, you could play, you could dance, you could have all the health that you want, but you are still a walking spiritually dead man or woman, boy or girl. All right, here's the second death, and that's called physical death, and that's when we're separated from life, and that goes back to the funerals, and maybe I could ask this question to bring it up close and personal. How many of you in the last year attended at least one funeral or memorial service personally? Would you raise your hand? Look at the many hands that are around here. And as we should live, there'll be more that we'll be going to. And so we talk about physical death, and that's when we separate from life. Physically, I'm alive right now. But there'll come a time that physically, my heart will stop, and I will be dead. Now, Carol says his heart stopped, but the beat goes on, you know. And so we might keep going, but in reality, physically, we're separated from life. Now, may I say this in all love to you, and I really do love you. We all will experience the first death. We're experiencing for that for some of us right now. We're spiritually separated from God. We will experience physical separation from life. But we don't have to experience the third type of death, and that's the eternal death separated from God forever in a real place called hell with no second chances. That's called eternal death. Now, as long as we remain in a spiritual state of death from God, and we die physically in that state, then we will then have the result of eternal death, separation from God forever. We don't have to do that. Well, let's just for a moment think about putting Humpty Dumpty back together again. Here's Humpty Dumpty. He had a great fall, and all the king's men and all the king's horses couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. I realize that. But do you know that God loves you, and he loves you so much because you're in his mind? And he loves what you could do now to bring glory back to him, but he's got to put you back together again. Maybe another illustration would help you. There's a wonderful new technology today, and it's called Direct TV. And generally, Direct TV is where that there is a satellite dish, and you can get television channels by the the by the dozens and maybe more. I'm not too familiar with it. But I know that if you've got the right TV and the right receiver, that that shows up into the satellite and you're connected appropriately without, with the right codes, you can connect to those particular stations that are out there. And there are many of them up there. Well, let me use this illustration to connect back to this. Adam and Eve, when they were first created, they too had direct, direct access to God. They could talk to God. God talked to them. When they were sinless, they were in a direct relationship with Almighty God. They had direct access. But when they fell, that signal with God was scrambled when they fell. Now, it doesn't mean they could never know anything about God. We might say it a different way for us. Some of you have cable in your home, maybe not a satellite dish. And through your cable, you have what is known as basic cable. Basic cable means that when you turn it on, you get basic channels on this. But there are a lot of other channels that are scrambled. I have my channels that I like. I like sports. I certainly like the news. I like to learn some things and some of the uh, so-called religious channels. Carol likes those as well, but she also likes HGTV. Maybe some of you are nodding your head. You know that as well. But there are other channels that we don't get because we have a scrambler there. Well, not that I would want to have a scramble to have a descrambled, but in our relationship to God, we are basic cable ready. We're cable ready. In our access to God before we trusted Christ, there is general revelation of the Lord. We can look out at His beautiful creation and say, hmm, something or someone had to create that. We could go into the Bible and start reading about God and have some understanding, but not a full understanding of who God is. That's called general revelation. So we're cable ready. But we're still scrambled in our ultimate connectivity to God. And so who is the descrambler in our life? that descrambler is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Which now tells me that I am not so depraved that I could never be saved. I'm not so depraved that I could never ever have a relationship with God. I can. So let's talk about how do we have a do-over? How do we start again? Well, because of the fall, 
it caused two critical needs in our life. You might want to listen to this. That fall of Adam and Eve and all the problems that we have boils down to two critical needs that we have. And here they are. Critical need number one is this. Our need is to have our relationship restored to the Lord. And in reality, even that's not a good way. We could say to have a relationship, period, with the Lord. We need that. We need to have fellowship with the Lord. It's not that He needs to have fellowship with us. It's we need the Lord desperately. It's not just that we need fire insurance from hell. It's not just so we have a little bit more power to live in this life. But it's so we can enjoy the intimacy with the only true God. And that's what we need. But here's the second part, which in a sense, we'll never have the first need met until we have the second one understood. And that's this. And that is we need God to do the restoring of us to fellowship back to Him. Now that is critical. That's the whole difference between Christianity and religion. Religion will say, okay, you as mankind had your Humpty Dumpty and you fell. But now if you want to be put back together again, and if you want to know God, you've got to do it yourself. And so mankind and all of their belief systems, they'll create ways to try to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Unfortunately, it doesn't work. But even more unfortunately, is there are a lot of people that will pick and choose all the different systems to put Humpty Dumpty back together again and then they think Humpty Dumpty is back together again and they go throughout life smiling just believing that everything is going to be okay in the hereafter only to find out horrifically wrong they are that they did not put Humpty Dumpty back together again properly because mankind cannot put Humpty Dumpty back together again only God himself can do that. And we must realize that we cannot save ourselves. So now the question is, all right, I'm so broken. I can't put myself back together again. God puts me back together again. How does he do it? Well, he does it with three truths. And I hope that you'll understand these. The first truth is this. It's called the substitute truth. The substitute truth. Well, for those of you that go to school, you know what a substitute often can be. Your main teacher isn't there, and they bring in someone else who can then teach or at least babysit you until the real teacher gets there. Some of you that have played in sports, you know that if you get hurt, they put in a substitute in your place. Now, generally, those that are in the position of creating substitutes to take the place of someone, they generally do this. They set up a criteria of what the substitute should be like, a requirement. Then they look for the person that fits that particular requirement and they put them out there as the substitute. Well, that's not bad. That's how they should do it. Well, if we need a substitute in our place to get to God, what would it be? God then sets up the criteria of what kind of person would be an acceptable substitute. Well, to begin with, it had to be God himself. Secondly, it had to be man at the same time who is God who lived a perfect sinless life. The substitute had to be willing to go to the cross and to die God's way to pay for sin. He had to make the complete payment for that sin as a perfect sacrifice and then rise again from the dead. Now I've given you one of many verses that are found in scripture to show you who the substitute is to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Look at it if you will. Scripture says, For Christ also suffered once for sins. Now let me pause there for a moment. That little phrase immediately shows the fallacy in other religions that say that on Sundays or other times we have to celebrate a particular service because that service is the re-killing of Christ. It's the re-suffering of Christ again for our sins that we committed that particular week. This verse says when Christ suffered on the cross, died on the cross, he suffered for our sins once and for all, meaning the ticket's been paid for. But even that's not all of the substitute. It says... The just being Christ for the unjust, that's you and me. So Jesus Christ stepped in as our substitute as the one that fit God's required criteria. That he might bring us to God. See, it's not me bringing myself to God by good works. It's he bringing me back to God. How did he do it? He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. So one more time in that verse alone, you see the Trinity again. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So now we can look to Christ. He is the substitute. Is he being the substitute enough so that Humpty Dumpty can be put back together again? No, it's not enough. 
He's the right substitute. He fits the right criteria. But now he's got to go do the job that he now fits the criteria to do, which would be the second one, the provision. Here's what God does now. He said he knew that man had, would fall, so we have the cure, excuse me, we have the curse before we have the cure. And the cure is found in the provision. And look at the verse here. It was read to us earlier today. Such a dear, dear, sweet, special, most powerful verse. For God so loved the world. Now for a moment, wherever you might be, I want you to personalize this. Yes, he does love the whole world and all the kinds of people in the world. But right now, for God so loved you, my friend. God loves you. But he didn't just say he loved you. He just doesn't have the character of love, but he also has the characteristic that he gave his only begotten son. And in the margin you could say, and he provided his only son. Now that son was a perfect substitute to die for you. The perfect one that went to the cross. He gave his only son. Now you have the substitute, you have the response, or you have the provision, now we have the response. This is what we need to do with this. There's a personal choice involved. Sovereignly, God put the plan together. Sovereignly, God had Christ as the substitute. Sovereignly, he provided it by Christ's death and resurrection on the cross, so he's done his part. Sovereignly, he now gives you the opportunity to place your faith in Christ. And here's the response. Now, listen very carefully if you don't have a Bible open in front of you. It goes like this. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. I love that. And that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Not of works. So you don't work to get the faith. You don't work to have salvation. Lest anyone should boast when you get to heaven. And then John 3.16 again at the end says that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Notice the word faith. Notice the word believe. And also notice the phrase not of works. So if you will listen very carefully. Our response is not going to be one of, all right, that's who Jesus is. Now I need to respond by loving him. I need to respond by following him. I need to respond by obeying him and all the commandments and everything else. That is not our response. That will get us to heaven. Our response is not going to be, I believe. I have faith. That's not our response. That will not get us to heaven. You see, it has to have the right object. Now we've got another issue. What's the right object? The right object cannot be, all right, I believe in my good works. Or I believe in my religious system. Or I believe that God is somehow going to take care of all this in the end, which is not found in Scripture. It is also not, I believe in Jesus Christ and doing a lot of good deeds to keep my salvation. It is faith alone. Listen, folks. If you go back to the writings before the Reformation, you will find that there was a major religious system in the world that would tell people that going to heaven is by faith. They would even say, believe in Jesus Christ. Oh yeah, they had a lot of other religious liturgical rituals involved in all of this, but they would still say it's by faith. What made the Reformation so profound is when the Reformers went back to Scripture and found that, hmm, it's not just believe, it's believe only in Christ. And they coined a Latin phrase, sola fide, faith alone. So it's faith, yes, but it is faith alone in Christ. Last week, many of you knew that I had my family here uh, from the mainland. And they sat up here in the front and, and my brother looks like me and I look like him and my sister looks like us and all that kind of good stuff. And and you were praying for them because I mentioned to you that it would mean more than anything to me that they would finally place their faith in Christ. And I knew they were on a spiritual journey. They've known I've been in ministry in some fashion since 1966, but they've heard it a couple of times, maybe more. Christmas cards with gospel literature in there. But I never heard them say that they would trust Christ. At the conclusion of last Sunday's message, we asked them if they would respond, and anybody would respond, and they did respond in a very positive way. Well, I knew, though, that a response by writing a note or raising a hand or even walking an aisle, uh, we need to do a little bit more. We need to probe a little bit to, to, to hopefully understand where they were going. And so on Wednesday, Carol made a delightful lunch, and on our back lanai, my brother and sister-in-law were there, and God opened up a wonderful opportunity for us to probe and explore what faith they really had. 
And so in the course of that conversation, I pushed back my chair and I said, you know, I'd like to ask you a question. On Sunday, I noticed that we went through the little message on the Holy Spirit and all that, but I am, I am most concerned with, with, with knowing for sure if you were to die today, are you absolutely positive that you would go to heaven? And it was neat because they both very quickly said, yes, I know, I know. Now, most people might stop with that and celebrate. They know, but that wasn't good enough. I wanted to hear how they knew. So I said to Carolyn, I said, Carolyn, let me ask you a question. I'm glad you know, but here's my question. If you were to stand before God and God asked me, asked you, how do you know for sure you'd go to heaven? Why should I let you into my heaven? Why? How would you answer? And she said, well, very simple. It's what you told us to do on Sunday morning. I said, no, that's not good enough. <laughs> what are you going to do? And she looked at me and she said, I believe in Jesus Christ as the one who died for me. I mean, I just, I mean, I just about came out of that my chair. I was so excited. But that wasn't good enough. And here's what I did. Some of you have seen this already. I said, picture on this little mountain that's on the backside of our lanai, three doors. On one door has a phrase, second door has a phrase, the third door has a phrase. But only one door, when you open it, is the door with the entrance into heaven. The other two doors, when you open that door, is the entrance into separation from God in a literal place called hell. Now, you don't know which door to choose, but you do have a choice. Door number one says, going to heaven is by good works of whatever kind. Door number two, going to heaven is by faith in Jesus Christ and doing good works. And then I said, and door number three over here is a door that says, it's only by faith in Christ. Now you have a choice, Carolyn. Which is the right door? And I mean without batting an eye. She said, it's door number three. It's only by faith. Well, I'd like you to know that she, and best as I can understand as we went through that, she has trusted Christ as her Savior to the best of my knowledge. But I say that to you. Christ was her substitute. God provided salvation through Christ. But she, by the prompting of the Holy Spirit, made the right choice then to place her faith alone in Christ. And with the time of prayer, it was a sealed deal at that particular time. I hope you make that right choice. But salvation is a bunch of current events, not just past history. And so once you trusted Christ as Savior, certain things happen. While you can never lose your salvation, we're all under new management. And maybe that's where you'd like to be today, is under new management. You now know that Christ died for you. And those of you that are listening to me, maybe on a CD, you're saying, how do I, get, how do I, how do I seal this deal? Here's what you could say to the Lord. Lord, I believe that Jesus Christ is God. I believe that Jesus Christ died, and when he died, he paid my sin debt. He rose again from the dead through that process. I don't understand all of that, but I do understand that I cannot get into heaven by my good works. And so right now, I am trusting Christ as my Savior. And so, Lord, thank you. You're talking to the Lord. Lord, thank you for dying on the cross for me and rising again. Thank you for the forgiveness of my sin. Now, I don't know all that happens, but I can tell you on the authority of God's inerrant word that if you place your faith alone in Christ, you won't perish but have everlasting life. Now, the things I'm about to share with you now as we bring this message to a close are things that you do not to get into heaven. These are things that you do not to keep going to heaven so you don't lose this relationship with the Lord. But they are things to say you're under new management. Some things you can do now that you're a new believer. So let me give them to you quickly. First, we talk to God, that's called prayer. Let me encourage you to ramp up your prayer life. And those of you who are believers in Christ and you're listening to this, how's your prayer life? Do you really pray? Not just rub-a-dub-dub, thanks for the grub type prayers. Not just a prayer when you're going through a crisis and oh my goodness, my child is sick or about to lose my job or I, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm talking about a daily time that you set aside to commune with the Lord. And then how about getting together with other believers? They've got a wonderful midweek prayer time here on Wednesday nights. A group of solid people that love the Lord in their own little humble way, praying and talking to the Lord. But have a time of real intimacy with God. Oh, the time to talk to God. Remember that relationship that God wants you to have with Him. Secondly, God talks to us through Scripture. If you really want to know God's mind on paper, you've got to get a Bible. 
If you don't have a Bible, maybe you could get a Bible, ask for one for Christmas, but get yourself a Bible. And then let me urge you to be here every single Sunday. God has divinely given you the opportunity to be here. This is a top priority for Christians to gather together, not forsaking the assembling of themselves together. And you come with a spirit of a student, a spirit of a servant learner. And you want to learn God's word here every Sunday. I promise you from this pulpit, you will learn biblical truths to get in a deeper relationship with him. But more than that, we've got connection groups in Kapuhulu. We have them here on Sunday mornings. We're going to be launching our wave ministry in January. The men are now planning on when they're going to meet in the early morning hours before they go to work to set their heart, turn toward God as they face this world for him. Got great things planned. There are small groups for new believers, but a time for you to get into God's word corporately, but then to study it on your own. And then fellowship with other believers. Oh, you'll always have good, sweet fellowship and connection groups. That's part of the dynamic of it. We have good fellowship here on the Lanai, don't we? But let me remind you, the fellowship to meet together on Sunday mornings, to be here every Sunday, to make this a priority for you to learn. And yay, let me encourage you to start Sunday at 9 o'clock so you could be a part of our connection groups then. And then finally, for those who know Christians, you're going to talk to those who don't know Christians, who don't know Christ, and you want to speak to them, and that's called evangelism. We've got some tremendous opportunities for you to, since you're a new believer in Christ, to invite your unsaved, un, non-Christian friends, your non-Christian friends, to events where the gospel will be presented. Our Thanksgiving service on Thursday, there won't be any formal gospel presentation, but it's an opportunity for you in a friendly environment to invite your family and friends, if you don't have a family on the island, this is especially for military and those without family, to bridge together and make some new friends. We've got some other opportunities in, in December with our Night of Delights and our Christmas Eve service. All of our morning services will be focusing on Jesus Christ, the one born to die, to be king. And so we'd love for you to use that as an opportunity. But we've got some special little gospel tracks for you to put inside all of your Christmas cards. But if you really are thankful that God saved you, wouldn't you be thankful that he could save someone else the same way? And you're the one God wants to use to bless them with that message of salvation. And I pray so. Let's pray, shall we? With every head bowed and every eye closed. These are five simple truths. And today we learn the truth that salvation is knowing it's by faith alone in Christ. And I pray, my dear friend, that you've trusted Christ as your Savior. But just in case you haven't, maybe today is the day of your salvation. So maybe say this to the Lord, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I've done things wrong. But Lord, I know that I'm the Humpty Dumpty too that fell off the wall and I can't put myself back together again. But I'm going to place my faith in Christ and have now a new birth, a new beginning, a do-over because I'm placing my faith in the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, if you're doing that, I'd like to pray for you. Now, my praying for you won't even get you into heaven. Only God will take you there when you place your faith in Christ and you've made the right response. But I want to see how many in here made that right response today by trusting Christ by faith alone. Now, if you've already done that, you've already trusted Christ, praise God. Now, go tell somebody. But for those of you that are doing it today, today is the day you're responding. I'd like to pray for you. Is there anyone at all? by an uplifted hand that would indicate that you're trusting Christ. Today is the day. Would you put it up right now so I can see it? Anyone at all? Okay, Christians, whether or not you raise your hand, whoever you might be, I want you to know that God knows your heart and your thought. Let me encourage you now to share this message, whatever venue you can, with others. And be faithful with it. How blessed that is. Now, Father, I want to just come to you now and thank you that you made salvation so easy for us. It's by faith. No, it's not easy believism. Definitely not that. Because, Father, you had to die and rise again from the dead. And we had to turn from whatever we thought would get us to heaven. We had to repent, so to speak. And that's hard to do. Hard to give up our old belief systems and place our faith in you. But yes, going to heaven is easy in the sense we don't have to do good deeds to get there, but just do it by faith. Now, Father, I pray for the person who's listening to this tape or the radio program right now. 
that wherever they might be, they're going to call upon you to be their Savior and that they would let us know about it so that, Father, we can come alongside them and coach them and help them and be their friend and to serve them in their journey as they get to know you even better on their way to heaven. Now, Father, I love you now in Jesus' name. Amen. You're listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando, Florida. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It is the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. Or you can mail your gift to Make It Clear, P.O. Box 607-901, Orlando, Florida, 32860. Thank you for helping us make it clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please send us an email at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear. Make it clear.